Hey, what's up, everybody? I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World and the Black Business School. <clears throat> and um, I uh, like to pop in every now and then uh, to connect with you guys and to let you guys know what's going on. Um, I'm kind of sitting in the middle of a space where I get a lot of stories sent to me. And uh, there's some things that I will can, I can share with you that uh, hopefully will enhance your day. Um, I uh, Just yesterday, I ran a, uh, a half marathon, which was uh, some really painful painful shit but it was a lot of fun and i uh, got a chance to spend time with the woman and uh her birthday's coming up so uh i'm excited about that i also heard from um uh i talked to charlamagne the guy uh yesterday about uh what he and ti are doing with um <clears throat> their initiative um on the breakfast club or excuse me not on the breakfast club sorry he and ti went to uh, uh dc uh to speak to some politicians about initiatives to get in additional investing in the black community and so um i uh you know i, I just get, get, spoke my piece uh, if you go to drboystv.com you can see my video on the topic i did kind of an extensive video on that topic to kind of say okay um you know i think that's awesome i love what what, what, what he's doing i love what ti is doing i love what charlamagne is doing i mean these are guys that i really uh respect um and uh, guys that I really think are just excellent, 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 um, you know, additions and support mechanisms for the community. Uh, just awesome guys. And um, anyway, so <clears throat> so they um, so I, I did my video and I got a, t a pretty long text from Charlemagne, uh, basically kind of giving me uh, a take on it. Um, he said he saw the video and he said he agreed with what I had to say. And I think that I got a sense, and I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to reveal too much of what was discussed in the text, but I'll say I got a sense that one of the hurdles that is going to exist in the community is getting people behind what they're doing. You know, there, there are some black folks out here that uh, seem to really think <clears throat> that investing is just a bad idea. Um, and I don't know how these people expect us to ever build an economy. I don't know how they ever expect us to build anything for ourselves. Um, you know, they think that white people are supposed to do it for us. Uh, and in particular, there's an article in The Nation that someone pointed out to me uh, in which people were critical of, of some of what they were doing. I got to go take a good look at it. Um, it says, well, Aaron Ross Coleman says that black capitalism won't save us. Celebrities like Killer Mike and Jay-Z equate black ownership with liberation. But you can't end, can't end racial inequality with consumerism. So uh, I'm looking at this article and it says, uh, last month Jay-Z fumbled his tribute to the slain rapper and entrepreneur Nipsey Hussle. Performing a eulogy freestyle in New York City's Webster Hall, he told his audience they could best honor Nipsey Hussle's legacy by claiming eminent domain over their neighborhoods and gentrifying their community. The performance drew shock and condemnation. Being told to gentrify your neighborhood by someone else, or by someone accused of gentrifying his own is predictably infuriating. Yet Jay-Z wasn't the only public figure mining the rapper's death for free market Talking points. Uh, Senator Cory Booker resurrected Nipsey's mission to buy back the block. Issa Rae emphasized the importance to own our communities. Blavity touted the need to bank black. Celebrities and well wishers surely have good intentions when they make plans to revitalize <clears throat> black areas like Nipsey's uh, South Los Angeles. Uh, but entrepreneurship and consumerism can only do so much because the reasons black neighborhoods are troubled mass eviction, mass incarceration, double digit unemployment, redlining can hardly be blamed on the dearth of black ownership. Changing them will require political and artistic narratives that extend far beyond the scope of black commerce. Long before Nipsey's death, the myth mythical prowess of black-owned businesses loomed as epic folklore. From Malcolm X's speeches calling black communities to build companies larger than General Motors to Jay-Z's The Story of OJ, in which the, rappers tell, the rapper tells dealers to take your drug money and buy the neighborhood, tales of entrepreneurial liberation have been on heavy rotation in the culture for generations. The narrative of emancipatory, emancipatory commercialism runs deeper still. Documentaries like The Green Book, Guide to Freedom, show elders recounting how black-owned businesses created unprecedented wealth in the community. High Flying Bird, a film by Terrell Alvin McCraney, imagines an NBA revolt where black athletes create a co-op league of their own. Uh, Netflix's trigger warning urges viewers to invest in black businesses. The vision behind these works sees entrepreneurial black folks as free, free from exploitation, full integration, and racism. While the politics of transform transformative ownership animate the world of entertainment, it can be poisonous for public policy. No show better illustrates this than Killer Mike's trigger warning. Like Nipsey Hussle, Killer Mike is a successful entrepreneur, activist, and rapper. Where much of Nipsey's rhetoric focused on empowering people as entrepreneurs, Mike's politics preach of the power of consumerism. 
quote, I think that the black community can do a better job of keeping the dollar in our ecosystem longer, Mike said on his reality show. White and Asian people, Mike notes, recirculate money in their communities for weeks, while black communities only recirculate, retain their, their, theirs for hours. After citing this fuzzy math, he then praised Jim Crow, of all things, saying that during segregation from top to bottom, the ecosystem from a dollar perspective stayed black. Hence, we had a true black working class, a true black middle class, and we could send kids off to college. Here, Mike's logic points toward a type of economic segregation that would supposedly generate wealth through the ownership of black businesses. Let me stop there and let me just say this guy, uh, you know, I don't know this guy who wrote this article, but uh, let me look at his name. Um, it looks like his name is Aaron Ross Coleman. Now, um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if Aaron Ross Coleman, you know, is, is basically a guy who leans to the left. Um, people who lean deep to the left tend to sort of hate anything that involves um, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, entrepreneurship. They they tend to hate things that involve, especially um, you know, the development of corporations or or free enterprise. Uh, that would be a better way to describe it. Uh, let's see. He says I write about race and economics. New York Times, BuzzFeed, The Nation, Box, CNBC, uh, The Huffington Post, etc. So unfortunately, this guy. I don't know how old he is, but I'm willing to bet you that he's a guy who um, pretty much has established his career by getting white people to hire him. To write articles. Now, it does not mean that he is um, that he's an idiot. It does not mean that he's a bad person. It does not mean that he does not mean well. But if white people did not back him, if he lost his number one backer, his number one donor, his number one funder, his number one economic daddy, if his economic daddy, which is called White America, suddenly bailed on his ass and cut him out, he'd be done. You wouldn't. You would never hear from him again. You'd never see him again. I mean, if you look at his. Uh, I'm looking at his Twitter page and I see this brother. He's first thing he brags about is he writes about race and economics in the New York Times, BuzzFeed, New York Times, white owned, Jewish owned, uh, BuzzFeed, white owned, The Nation, white owned, Vox, white owned, CNBC, white owned, HuffPost, white owned, The Marshall Project. Don't know much about The Marshall Project. And then he has this. Check this out. This is interesting. He has hire me after that. Right. So he's trained to beg for jobs. Right. He's trained to beg for jobs. No disrespect to him. He's probably good at the jobs that he gets, but he's trained to beg for jobs because that's all he knows. He doesn't know um, ownership. He doesn't know being a boss. He doesn't know uh, what it means to be a captain of industry on any level, even small amounts of industry. All he knows is uh, begging for a job and getting a white person to hire him to go write an article. Uh, and, uh, and and that's fine. But the problem is that people have to like they have to understand that, you know, without job creators, you have no job. And the thing is that when you get those jobs as a black person, you're kind of like the one selected lone Negro who gets those jobs. I bet you that if he were to gather the whole staff from the New York Times together or BuzzFeed or The Nation or Vox, uh, there would be a couple of black people in the room and a whole gang of white folks. Right. And, and, and what you're seeing in that room when you're only seeing two or three black people is you're seeing all the hundreds of thousands or millions of black people who are blocked out of that room. Who, can, who will never get to come in that room, who will never get a chance to be hired at Box, who will never get hired at BuzzFeed, who will never be hired at the New York Times, because these are racist organizations, not because they're in inherently determined to be racist and bad people, but because they take care of their own. They hire their own. They hire their own. When America was founded and America wanted to be a great you know, country and a great economic captain of the world, America did not go to China and look, for, look for jobs. America, you know, did not say, well, let's all go to England and hope that they hire us in England. America didn't, America didn't say, well, maybe we go all get on a boat and go to Australia. We can get jobs over there. They said, no, we need to create industry. And when we create industry, we will create jobs within that industry. You know, we, we have to build our own. Uh, so this concept of building your own, <clears throat> it is only an impossible. It is a common concept for most nations, most uh, groups of people throughout the world who've ever known what it's like to have any form of independent power. It's only it's only foreign to black people who are still stuck on slave, not stuck on stupid, but stuck on slave stupid. That's that's like stupid. That's like double stupid. Right. So we are the only group of people who looks at the concept of building your own industry as an impossibility, as something that is just only, oh, my God, that's impossible. How the hell? What the hell are you talking crazy, man? Talking about building your own businesses. Who the hell said we, we that's not possible. Businesses can't be built. Well, I can show you guys pictures of companies like Google that were founded in somebody's garage, you know, 20 years ago, who are now worth a trillion dollars today. You know, I can show you uh, Apple and other companies that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not a trillion or more, or close to a trillion, that started literally as nothing. You know, and so what happens with black people we have, is we have a, a problem with something that I call economic abortion. 
Economic abortion is not, I'm not talking about just the real abortion. You can feel how you want to feel about that. But economic abortion is where every great economic idea, every great economic possibility, every entrepreneurial piece of entrepreneurial spirit that comes out of our children is aborted before it ever gets a chance to be born. You abort brilliant ideas before they get anywhere. Either you commit the abortion yourself, you stick that the hanger up your ass and, and you yank the baby out and you basically kill the idea because you have been taught to believe that it's impossible for you as a black person to do the same shit that white people do every goddamn day. White people do this every day. White people do this all the time. Asian people do it all the time. Everybody else does it all the time. Jewish kids teach their kids this stuff as, as standard learning for what it means to be a Jew. But your black ass will abort your economic baby, your, your your genius idea, before it ever has a chance to breathe. And if you don't abort it, then somebody else is going to abort it. Somebody else, some other black person with a uh, with a uh, stuck on stupid slave mentality, who still think who who, who only knows uh, how to get money through a job, who only knows that way of existing, is going to come along and say, "Man, what you talking about, bro? Come on, you black, you a black man in America. You can't you can't build nothing. You know, come on, man, just like stop it, man. Stop talking crazy. Like just you know, they got they hired down at the post office, man. You you gonna pass up a good job at the post office to pursue this stupid little dream you have of building a company? You can't even get a bank loan." You can't even get a bank loan. What What makes you think that this can ever be anything? You can't even get what you need to, to build this company. You know, and, and, and I'm going to tell you, it reminds me, the reason I use abortion as an analogy is because is because those things offend me. You know, when my mother gave birth to me, my mother was pregnant with me when she was 16 years old. 16 years old. My daddy was 15. And my daddy was not around. My daddy, I do not, I never know, I never knew Boyce, who was my father. That was his real name. Uh, I only knew my mother. My mother gave birth to me when she was 17. Before she gave birth to me, they t she was pretty much told that it would be a huge mistake to have a baby at her age. She was poor. She, you know, she's struggling. Why would you run, want to bring a poor baby into the world that you can't afford to take care of? Why, why would you, um, you know, give birth to this child, you know, when you could just go on and go to school and live your life and be free and not have to worry about this? And maybe you can have a baby later on when you're more financially secure. Well, my mother didn't believe it. My mother actually said that she went to the altar. She went to God. And uh, I get I get touched when I hear this story. She said that she was so scared, but faith carried her through. And she went to God and said, uh, to, she said, God. God, I can't take care of this baby. I don't know how. I don't know what to do. I, I don't. I, I'm scared. I, I just. I have no guidance. Can you please? I'm handing this baby to you. And the reason she said she did this, I swear to God, she told me this. And she said that she did not say that about any of her other kids. Now my, my brother and sister are great. Don't get me wrong. But she said I didn't say that about any of my other children. Because I'm like, oh come on, mama, you probably say that about everybody. She said no. She said it was my. She said with you, she said I felt like there was some greatness that I carried inside of my belly that was you. She said, I felt like you were supposed to do something important and me not giving birth to you would be a sin against the universe, that you were supposed to be born because you're supposed to do something bigger than I could even imagine. And, and literally, <clears throat> you know, years later, I'm talking to you. And guess what? As I'm talking to you, I'm probably talking to another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 people, a million people a week, approximately on a platform that we own, that, we, that is owned by us. Right. So what am I, my point is to say, you know, <clears throat> you know, when you are when you constantly abort your greatest ideas and your greatest possibilities, you end up killing off a piece of the universe. You, you're committing a sin against the universe, I believe. Not not that, to get biblical on you. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that you can't tell me black people ain't brilliant. You can't tell me black people ain't the greatest geniuses to ever walk the face of this. You can't tell me that we got a type of resilience and a strength in our DNA and in our melanin that just allows us to do things and make other people say, oh my God, how did they do that? Right? I, and, and, <clears throat> and so, um, you know, when I see articles like this, I become concerned because, you know, I just kind of I'm like, what are you? What good are you doing by telling people to have no hope? What are you doing? What good are you doing by by killing any any possibility of a brighter future for the black community? Uh, what are you? You have no you have no arguments to make. You have nothing to show. For the last 50 years, we've done this great experiment called integration. You know, we've done this great experiment called uh, voting for the Democratic Party. We've done this great experiment called waiting for the white man. And every single time, this experiment has failed. So what are you offering? 
suffering other than destruction and sadness and hopelessness and a lack of confidence that we the confidence that we will need in order to build the nation that we believe we can build. You know, you, you're not offering anything. So if you can't offer a better solution, then just go take your little job at BuzzFeed and get the fuck out. Like, seriously, just just go work for white folks. Ain't nobody going to bother you. Ain't nobody going to call you no names or, or dog you out. You know, but I hope the white people never get tired of you because that's what they because because that's what they do to Negroes. They they you, you the Negro of the year one year and then they boot you out the next. E40 said in the song, it, the chorus was, they'll find a new nigga next year. Well, they do that in every field and, and some black people are tired of this. So when you have black people, they have a better vision and a bigger dream. Maybe their dream is a little crazy. Maybe their dream can't be realized anytime soon. Maybe T.I. and Charlemagne are out their damn mind going to Capitol Hill to try to get more invested in black communities and build more businesses. Maybe they're just big old fools. Well, then let them just go be fools. Let them sometimes the greatest achievements in history have been achieved by somebody who was not who was not wise enough to realize that what they were actually accomplishing was supposed to be impossible. Think about this. The bumblebee flies this because the bumblebee is not smart enough to know that bumblebees are not supposed to fly. He does not know he's too fat to fly. He, he just flies anyway. He does not know his wings are too small to lift his little fat ass body. He just flies because he says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fly. And he's not smart enough to know. He, no scientist has ever talked to the bumblebee and said, hey, dog, you might as well not even try because because you know you're too fat to fly, so you might as well just sit there, right? So what I'm saying is sometimes people do the impossible because they believe anything's possible, and you should not kill that dream before they get a chance to try it out because sometimes you're not, in fact, all the time, you're never smarter than God. You're never smarter than the universe. Sometimes the universe really does have a plan for you that's bigger than your little tiny-ass mind can comprehend. There, there are twists in the road coming up. There are opportunities that will open up. There are things <clears throat> that will, blessings that will come your way if you just keep trying. And you're not smart enough to know what you're capable of. You're just not. I, I, I can just tell y'all. I, do you know how many times I have killed possibilities in my life by not believing in myself? By literally shutting myself down before I even had a chance for anything good to happen? Seriously, you miss a you know you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Just so you know that if you don't take the shot, you're definitely going to miss. So let me keep going. So the, hit the thumbs up button, please, if you're watching on YouTube or something. Please hit the thumbs up button. Uh, also, don't forget we have a social media platform now owned by us uh, called Black Enough. This is we created this uh, because we knew things were going to happen, like Farrakhan, how he got banned from Facebook. More bans are coming. I get banned all the time. So we started this project two years ago, and um, and we, it's been growing ever since. So go join Black Enough if you want if you want to be around other Black people and have Black conversations where you won't get banned or kicked off or scolded like a child. Um, so here, let me see here. Um, let me read more. Um, politicking with a group of black barbers might conclude that because we aren't focused on our dollar, our whole community seems to be suffering. The first episode follows Mike attempting to ameliorate this suffering by, quote unquote, living black. He commits to consuming goods only from black owned businesses with black supply chains, which leads him to face the limits of racial autarky, autarky. That's a that's a nice word. He probably learned that in college. Good for him. Little college educated Negro. He that means he's special. Uh, when he wants to smoke, he can. His dealer sources from white marijuana farms. When he's hungry, there's only one sparsely stocked black grocer. When he travels outside Atlanta for a show, he can't find a black hotel. Even when he wants to drive, he can't because all his cars are made by white companies. The show chronicles the painful one man boycott that by the creator's own account leaves Mike hungry and wandering the streets in the dead of night. However theatrical, the episode broadcasts how years of compounded divestment have made the politics of black capitalism useless. Okay, I don't even like the term black capitalism because capitalism is a is a nuanced term anyway, by the way. So so capitalism, black people don't have to practice, practice capitalism. What black people need is black free enterprise. We need black entrepreneurship. We need black investment. We don't necessarily need capitalism that is a replica of what white people are doing because unfortunately white America is destroying its country, just so you know. Because uh, white capitalism consists of massive amounts of government debt. Uh, it consists of um, extreme amounts of exploitation to the point where uh, your military has become a bunch of mercenaries that are hired to go around the world and conquer other countries just to get their resources. That's what Obama did to uh, Qaddafi in Libya. Um, it, it, you know, you, you, your workers' rights are trampled. Uh, it's, it's, a really, it's a really bad 
outcome. You know, when you believe, when you allow the richest people in society to believe that they shouldn't have to pay 1% more in taxes so people can eat, that's a, that's a, that's a, a problem that exists within the moral fabric of this country, and black folks are not built that way. I think I believe that we are better people than other people in this country in the sense that um, there are things that just don't sit right with our spirit, and we don't do those things. Um, in America, at every stage of the business life cycle, the economy beats black businesses like a pinata. Battered by higher insurance prices, hammered by stingy investors, pummeled by exclusive supply chains, assaulted by recessions, thrashed by exclusionary regulations, pounded by intergenerational wealth gap, a hobbled community of marginal black worker entrepreneurs must compete with, with American monopolies and oligopolies like Walmart and Amazon, flush with cash and bolstered by lobbyists. The upshot is predictable because they are so wounded by the financial pressures that discrimination exerts. Black businesses often can only offer can offer only fewer locations, higher prices, and fewer choices. Killer Mike's consumerism flounders under the racialized reality that black communities have been pushed down for too long to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So it sounds like he's kind of saying, like, just fuck it, just give up. You know, you're black people, you, there's no chance for you to have anything. Like, you're just getting your butt kicked. So I'm waiting for him to get to the twist. I'm waiting for him to get to the point where there's actually a ray of hope that will keep us from feeling like we should all just go jump in, off a bridge and kill ourselves. Um, Mike's troubles draw a striking comparison to one of the final scenes from James, Ball, James Baldwin's book of essays indicting American racism. Uh, the fire next time, after a long interview at the Chicago estate of Elijah Muhammad, Baldwin debates his chauffeur, uh, a young member of the Nation of Islam, who tells Baldwin how the black dollar could support a self-sufficient economy free from the ills of the country's bigotry. Quote, he spoke to me first of the Muslim temples that were being built, Baldwin wrote, or were about to be built in various parts of the states on, on the strength of the Muslim following and the amount of money that is annually at the disposal of Negroes, something like $20 billion. That alone shows how strong we are, he said. Baldwin, a well-read and well-traveled debater, who does not study economics, by the way, who is not a PhD in finance, who did not know anything about running a business. James Baldwin was like this guy. Um, you know, it sounds like James Baldwin was a great man. Don't get me wrong, great man. But he was not um, a finance, you know, professor, PhD. He, he wasn't a, uh, an entrepreneur. He wasn't a captain of industry. He was a writer, a good writer, a damn good writer. You know, but, but let's just be clear about that. So he's quoting Baldwin. He says, um, Baldwin, a well-read and well-traveled debater, quickly gives the young nationalist a two-piece. He pokes, asserting that additional segregation would shrink black spending power. He prods, inquiring about the political ramifications of a less productive economy. As he goes on, the man's face soon contorts, sensing that the driver is out of his depth and conscious enough not to break his spirit. Baldwin pulls back and speaks directly to the reader instead. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit. <clears throat> Just be clear. Write this down. I'm going to say it about three times, and I need y'all to make sure you hear it and repeat this to the Negroes that talk about segregation as a solution to anything. Segregation is not the same. Excuse me, scratch that. Integration is not the same as desegregation. I'm going to say it again. Integration is not the same as desegregation. Integration is not the same as desegregation. So when people talk about the flaws in the way the economy is built, they're not saying that we want to end integration by going back to segregation. Um, what they're saying is that they want to leave pure integration for something in which they have choice again, choice to segregate or desegregate based on what they want to do, right? They can integrate in certain areas. You segregate in other areas. You know, you do what the Chinese do. The Chinese, uh, who was it? Another group had that rule. I think it was, was it the Jews that had this rule? Um, we want you to buy everything from us, but we don't want to buy anything from you. Um, and that's what the Chinese do to the United States. That's why Trump is fighting the Chinese right now, because the trade gap uh, is so massive because the Chinese, they'll 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 sell you their shit all day long. But they're not going to buy from you or they'll buy from you a little bit just to make you feel good. But they're ultimately there to be the producer, not the consumer. Right. So what I'm saying to black people is that you have to at least flip the script a little bit. You are now you are primarily the consumer and you're rarely the producer. And that's how they milk you like a damn cow. They go in your communities and they build up these, you know, these stores and nail shops and everything else. And they get your consumption dollars and you're not playing the game. You're not getting it's like um. It's almost like uh, it's almost like playing basketball, football with somebody and they get the ball. So they, so they get a chance to score. And in football, after the other team scores, you're supposed to get the ball and you get a chance to score. Imagine playing football where you never got to play offense. You only had to play defense all the time. Well, you're going to lose every game because you're not going to score any points. 
So it doesn't mean that, that you're doomed because the other team is scoring off of you. What the problem is is that you're not scoring at all. You're not even trying to score. So if you're always playing defense, you can't score points on defense all the time. Right. So black people just have to make sure we get the ball. Sometimes you make money off us. Well, we got to make some money off you. You come in the hood. You want to build a business in the hood. Cool. You paying the tax to the hood. You funding the softball team. You're funding the, the little park we want to build. You're funding the community center and you're going to hire black people in this community and you're going to reinvest in this community. <clears throat> you're going to keep as much of this money in this in the community as you can. You will not grab and go. You will not hit it and quit it. You will not run through and gr grab a bag of money from us and then bounce it out to your suburbs. That shit ain't going to happen. You don't do that. You're not here to take. You need to be here to give. If you're here to give, then you can stay all day. But if you're here to take, then that's that's a problem because we do give and take. We don't do we don't do take and take. We don't allow you to do take and take, shake and bake because we're, we're, we're smarter now. We've been listening to people like Dr. Boyce Watkins and he explained to us that we're not here to get played. So that's pretty much what the issue is. Um, so, so what this brother from the Nation of Islam is saying to Baldwin is not problematic at all. What he's basically pointing to, which is obviously true actually, is that the Nation of Islam is one of the greatest uh, wealth builders in the black community. In fact, if we supported them more, supported their work, you know, as much as we support Disney when they come out with a new movie, the Nation of Islam would go out and build you a school system. They could get you a security force that might match the local police department. They could get you businesses in your neighborhoods because they build entrepreneurs. They train. I speak at the uh, Muhammad University of Islam, and all those young children were like 14 asking me questions that grad students asked me. It was the craziest thing. Smartest little kids I've ever met my life. And so we've got this in our community. We just don't support it. Y'all go support some damn Nike bullshit because Nike decided they want to give Colin Kaepernick a damn, a damn advertisement. So y'all run out buying some damn Nikes. But when, when the nation needs y'all's financial support, you ain't nowhere to be found. Well, no, support your own as much as you support them. It doesn't mean you can't support them, but support your own first. Black first. That's it. Black first. How did China get ahead? How did China become one of the greatest economic superpowers of the world? They have a China first philosophy. China first. But then here's the thing. Here's what's stupid about, about the way Americans think. So somebody comes along and they say, well, we, have, we now have an America first policy, right? I think Trump actually said it. God forbid, God forbid anybody think I'm supporting Trump. I'm not trying to do any of that because I don't want to get involved in none of that shit. But, you know, America first is actually not a bad mentality is actually a pretty good philosophy. <laughs> the, the reason we're falling behind is because we never put America first. When you put yourself last, you're going to end up last. <laughs> Seriously, when you put yourself first, you got a chance to be in first. So why would you not want to put America first if you're dealing with China? China puts Chinese first. Uh, why would you not put black first if you're black and you want black people to win? Why would you put black last? That doesn't make any sense, but we do that. We put ourselves last, we put other people first, and then you wonder why you're in last place. Get the hell up out of here with that. Hit the thumbs up button. Please hit the thumbs up button. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins. Welcome to Dr. Boyce TV. Um, if you want a free e-copy of my book, It Takes a Village to Raise the Bar, you can go to drboycewatkins.net. That's drboycewatkins.net. Uh, also, uh, we have, um, we're have we on iTunes, so the podcast is on iTunes and SoundCloud. So you can download either one of those apps, SoundCloud or iTunes, and you can listen to the podcast as well as, uh, as, well as catch it on video. So uh, we were speaking earlier. Charlemagne, uh, the guy, he sent me a text, and uh, we were texting about uh, what he and T.I. were doing on Capitol Hill, which I thought was great. And I did a video expressing my support. Charlemagne reached out to tell me he saw the video, but then he also shared uh, some thoughts about, you know, about people that have issues with what they're trying to do. And so what I'm doing is sharing my perspective to hope to just publicly state there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. Um, my condition on everything was just to make sure it's done in the right way. Make sure that when you set up these empowerment zones, you're not setting up white empowerment zones. See, the problem is that, because, you know, because we, we don't, we're not always hip to the game and other people are taking care of their own first, they'll set up things that look like they're there to help black people, but they'll end up helping everybody else but black people, like affirmative action. How the hell do we get to a country where white women get more affirmative action support than black people? You know, they, but that that's the sort of thing that happens. So anyway, he says, uh, the shortcomings Baldwin saw in the driver's politics in 1962 undermine killer mics today. Uh, Baldwin wrote that a massive black boycott would cost the driver his car, just as it claimed the Atlanta rappers on trigger warning, not to mention his cell phone and his diet. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. OK, so a black boycott. I mean, while the guy's trying to ridicule killer Mike's experiment, 
Um, I think what Mike is doing, I, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, Mike said he wants to come through my podcast at some point, and I don't pressure the brother. I mean, he's doing a whole lot of stuff. He got a lot of white friends and that are, you know, doing good stuff. He's doing great work with. I don't bother him too much, but uh, I am going to push him to come on in because I think Mike needs to come through to defend his point of view. Uh, I'll tell you where, one area Mike and I disagree a little bit is on Bernie Sanders. I, I, I don't really think that our leading black voices need to be too closely aligned to some of these politicians because some of these I just don't trust the engine I don't trust the system I think we can do a lot on our own and you can still you can have influence and just kind of lay back you can kind of sit back and say look I don't want to be involved in this but I am gonna you know I am willing to lend my voice to ideas that I agree with on a um on a per you know per item basis I'm not interested in you know I want it a la carte I don't want the whole value meal called the democratic ticket I don't want every single item on this agenda. I want to pick a la carte what I want. You know, I like that. I don't like that. I want that. I don't like that. So um, anyway, um, I think that what Mike was doing in the video was he was basically trying to show how much work we have to do. He's trying to show how much work we have to do. You know, he's trying to show that, look, you know, we don't have enough black businesses. We need to build more. Um, it doesn't mean that if you give up. See, this guy's saying, well, well, see, because there's no black businesses, you got to give up. You got to walk away. Don't don't even try it. This whole black liberation thing ain't going to work, boss, because cause y'all y'all don't got no businesses. Well, I mean, if you don't have any businesses, that means you go build businesses. Um, so anyway, he says, as a rule of thumb for evaluating the efficacy of a policy designed to affect black neighborhoods in 2019, it's always smart to double check the merits of any proposal endorsed by Donald Trump. Last December, he endorsed black capitalism in the form of opportunity zones. In an uncharacteristically diverse White House ceremony, Tim, Tim Scott, Ben Carson, and a cadre of bald black men in dark suits flanked Trump as he introduced his Opportunity Zones executive order. On its face, it looks benign. The program promises to leverage tax breaks and lean on investors, entrepreneurs, and HBCUs to, quote, revitalize and er economically in urban and economically distressed communities. But as with many of Trump's policies aimed at communities of color, opportunity zones flow from what legal scholars like Mesra Baradaban uh, describe as cynical and racist origins. In her book, The Color of Money, uh, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, Baradaban, Barada, Baradaran, whatever, explains how the program was innovated in Richard Nixon's administration as he took office in 1968. Black Americans reeled from generations of discrimination. Instead of mobilizing the large federal government response needed to quell racial inequality through reparations or targeted anti-poverty programs, the president, see, that's the thing. You can't, don't assume you're lifting the black community with anti, because you're doing anti-poverty programs. Every black person ain't poor. Every black person is not in poverty. Does not mean that there aren't black people in poverty, but stop equating blackness with poverty. How many of you right now, raise your hand, how many of you are poor? How many of you are in poverty right now? I, I'm not in poverty. A lot of you all are not in poverty. It does not mean that black people in poverty should not be considered. It just means that that can't be synonymous See, because that's, that's how they marginalize you. They equate you with the disabled, the broken down, the downtrodden, the the the, the busted, the broken, the the, the bitter, the, the the ruined. You know, and, and it's kind of it's kind of messed up. You know, it doesn't mean you can't be black and broke. I mean, I've been black and broke. We've all, many of us, have been black and broke at some point. But I think that when we equate it, when we say, oh yeah, we're helping black people, we got an anti-poverty program. Well, that's bullshit. You know, I know a lot of black people who ain't broke. In fact, I don't believe you could be too poor. And if you went to see the Black Panther movie and spent, you know, $60 taking your kids to see this movie from Wakanda, an imaginary place, and then you went out to Applebee's afterward and spent another $40, $50, you know, that's not, I mean, you got some money to spend. It doesn't mean you're rich. It just means you got money to spend. You got disposable income. Yeah, I could tell you some stocks you could have bought for that same amount of money. It doesn't mean I'm saying that you're an idiot for going to see the movie. It just means that stop pretending like black people have no disposable income. If we didn't have any disposable income, they wouldn't be marketing so many products to us that can be bought with disposable income. Uh, so anyway, let's see here. Uh, Co-opted the black power movements. The president nimbly co-opted the black power movement's rhetoric of self economic self-determination to push a segregated black economy, thereby justifying his neglect for other proposals of meaningful reform. So there, there's there's more there um, in the article. It's a long article in The Nation. You could take a look at it. Um, and basically, it sounds to me like this uh, person is using um, liberal. It's, it's a black liberal, right? Black liberals can be defined pretty easily most of the time. Black liberals are people who... Are, unfortunately, in many cases, can easily become white liberals in blackface. Um, they believe that advancements in the black community come down to 
uh, concepts like um, equality, diversity, inclusion, which kind of mean that they're looking for this socialist utopian society where everybody's treated equally, everybody gets the same, and we get a chance to have you know the same thing as everybody else. And uh, and that first of all, that that's an anti-competitive narrative in terms of where you want black people to go. You're kind of saying like we don't want black people to compete, we don't want them to do well, we just want them to be equal and to be included. Well, I can guarantee you that if you go into a football game and your goal is to be equal to the other team to try to tie the other team you're going to get your ass kicked nine times out of ten you're going to get your ass kicked especially if the other team's the one preparing you for the game and that's what happens we go into the great game of economics white people our competitors are preparing us for the game and the most we're hoping for is a motherfucking tie like we're really hoping that we can go out here and tie with white folks and and, and possibly be included and possibly have equality and they're not aiming for equality they're not aiming for equality of anything they're like yeah sure you can pretend like we're equal but i have a, a million dollars in assets and you have nothing so really we're not equal but we're equal because you know, when we both go to the grocery store, nobody calls you a nigger. So that makes you feel included. That makes you feel good. Good whoop de damn do. Good for you. Now go take your black ass back to your shitty neighborhood and you know with your incarcerated parents and go live your miserable life because we're equal now. You have nothing else to complain about. Um, the other thing about the white liberal is that they come along with a lot of baggage related to uh, social agenda items. Again, a lot of this has roots in in, in far left thinking, socialist, communist, etc. Uh, you know, where it's sort of like, OK, you know, we we got this agenda on uh, whether it's feminism or LGBT stuff or the environment or the way animals are treated, you know, things like that. And there's a lot of extra baggage for black people to carry around. And we carry around this extra baggage because we feel indebted to the Democratic Party, because when they were looking when they were sort of pursuing this sort of utopian, idealistic agenda, they included us amongst the broken and downtrodden. And they said, OK, yeah, we got to take care of, um, you know, of women and, 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 and handicapped and and right next to the handicapped and, and, and the animals will put the black people there too right and so the problem is a lot of black people don't see themselves as disabled they don't see themselves like animals we see ourselves as an empowered people that have the ability to compete just like everybody else i don't go into a room with with smart white men who know finances and think of myself as being equal or trying to be equal no i know that i have skills that they don't have so so i'm going to be the alpha in that room i'm the one that they need to learn from i'm not going to be just another person walking around the room no i'm going to be the teacher because i'm qualified to be their professor right so ultimately i think that uh, a lot of um what the liberals have sort of fed to us is not designed for us to accelerate uh you know we need an engine and they offer us maybe they offer us a sail with a hole in it right so your boat gets a sail with a hole in it but you really need an engine an engine is something that is able to move forward no matter which way the wind is blowing you know no matter which way the political wind is blowing you're going to move in the direction you want to go no matter which way the de whether it's the democratic wind blowing you're not going to flow in that direction just because you got democratic wind or that way because it's republican wind you're going to go in the direction that you want to go that is the essence of self-determination. Self-determination means that you that your direction, your trajectory, your destination is determined by self. And self-determination does not pay attention to black people. Listen to me closely when I say this. Self-determination does not mean that uh, that you are all rich. Self-determination does not mean black people are balling out of control and got 20 million in our bank accounts or that we have as much money as white people. No, self-determination just means that for black people, when we get up out of bed in the morning, there's not a white person telling us what to do. That's it. That's all it means. You ain't got to be rich to have that. You ain't got to be rich to have freedom. Freedom and money are connected. Money can help you obtain freedom, but you don't need money to be free. I know poor people who are freer than some of them, than my richest friends. So, so understand what we're aiming for. We're not aiming necessarily to become insanely wealthy. We're not aiming to have as many, um, you know, as many consumer options as, as we would have if we were buying from Walmart and Target. Like he was talking about earlier, how black businesses can't fulfill all the needs of the consumers because they don't have enough variety like a Walmart. Fuck that shit. We don't need to have as much stuff out there as, as Walmart's. Are. Who cares? You know, there were black people who will tell old folks who will tell you how they were happy. Uh, they loved the days when they could just walk down to Mr. Miller's corner store Knowing that in Mr. Miller's store, uh, it, it, instead of a loaf of bread costing three cents, it was five cents. But they loved it because they loved Mr. Miller and they loved buying from his store, right? Uh, you know, or or uh, you know, I might go in and 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 buy you know some furniture from a black person, and maybe it's not the best furniture I could get if I was searching at every furniture shop on earth. But 
I like the fact that I know that son of a bitch, he's my friend, and I'm buying from him, and I know he's going to use that money to feed his children, and he's going to come buy from me. That's a good feeling, man. That's a, a wonderful feeling. So to me, you know, black power and black economics, this ain't got nothing to do with no damn capitalism. This ain't about, you know, creating captains of industry and trillion-dollar companies and all that. I mean, maybe we'll do that. That'll be great when it happens, right? But you got to focus on what matters. What matters is just feeling safe and happy and having the ability to love and support each other and knowing that, you know, that a black kid can grow up, go to a black school down the street with a black teacher. And as he's walking to school, all his neighbors know him. They looking out the window, make sure he's safe. He gets in trouble. They, they might pull him in the house and scold him and call his mama. And, and, and the mama already knows what he did before he gets home, you know, and then he comes home to two black parents who love each other very much. They feed him, give him love. He does his homework. He grows up. He goes, and, you know, he maybe, he maybe when he's watching media, he's watching cartoons made by black people. He's checking out, you know, video or TV that's made by black people. Maybe it's even YouTube. Who cares? Who gives a shit, right? And then he grows up and he decides to go to school. He goes to a university where he's taught by more black people who then teach him how to come back to the black community and either work at a black business or create a black business that does not yet exist, right? Like, like, like all these things are doable. Black banks are creatable. You just have to be able to understand the scope of what it means, what a bank actually is. A bank is not something that's, you know, certified by the FDIC and this, this, and this. No, a bank is just a pool of resources that you can go to when you need some shit. I talked to my son today, and I and we were talking about money and financial stuff, and I said, well, you know, son, you, we got the family bank. You can always borrow from the family bank. Just make sure you pay that money back. What is the family bank? The family bank is basically a pile of money that we stacked up it, to hook to help out and hook up and take care of anybody who's just part of our clique, part of my family that I'm responsible for to make sure they're good, make sure they have access to capital so that no dreams are aborted unnecessarily. I can put money behind your business. I can make sure you can get your bills paid, help you out, do whatever it is you got to do. But you must understand the importance of coming back and giving back to that which you've taken. Right. So he did my so my son works for me. He, he comes in, he talks to me about stuff and we, you know, we work out business deals with each other. I'll do this if you can help me with that. Right. That's trade. Right. That's why the U.S. and China are fighting right now. And but it's going to be a hard fight because they trade with each other. This quid pro quo. I give you something, you give me something. And it, and it becomes a tough relationship to untangle. But it's a good relationship. It's mutually beneficial. It's supposed to be. So ultimately, black people, all black people really need at the end of the day. Stop labeling things. Stop labeling it as black capitalism. Stop setting purely financial goals. Stop thinking it's all about the money. What black people need is they need one term that nobody else uses in economics that I know of, and I'm going to use it right here to describe this movement. Black people need BEL. We need black economic love. Black economic love simply means that we need to connect with each other and do business with each other. We need to hire each other. We need to invest in each other. We need to buy from each other. We need to support each other. We need to talk to each other, share ideas, share resources, do whatever we got to do so that we can work together to build things together. And, and that's all it is. And just like regular love, it requires trust. It's very difficult to do sometimes if you if the other person doesn't understand how to love another person economically and otherwise. You know, if somebody's taken and not giving back, it's very tough. But if you work through it and everybody's on the same code of conduct, love can be a beautiful thing. And at the end of the day, you feel better when you're loved. You feel safer when you're loved. You feel more secure when you're loved. And so black people, when our community builds the economy that it's going to build, it's going to happen. It can't be stopped, even by a little... Guys like this who work for white people who sit back and become Negro naysayers, throwing rocks and eggs at every great idea that comes out of the black community. That's fine. Just feel feel sorry for him. You know, like like they said, like Jesus said or whatever, like forgive them, Father, for he knows not what they do. So just say when you see a, a little coon like that, just say, forgive him, Father Boyce, for he knows not what he do. And I'd be like, yes, I forgive him because I, I guess I'll get to be I'll get to be the father. I'm the old I got OG status. So, son, I forgive you for you know not what you do. You probably got out of college three, four years ago. And, and I understand the brainwashing is deep and you have Stockholm syndrome and we have a vision that is bigger than what you can see. But you must also understand that when these white folks get tired of him and they boot his ass out, it's going to be the black community that might consider re-embracing him. 
You know, it's happened many, many times before. You know, when these celebrities go out and they think that they white and then they get in trouble, what did OJ do? OJ went out here talking about, I'm not black, I'm OJ. He was hanging out with white people, thought he was white, thought their race didn't matter, making fun of people like me and you. And then as soon as they, as soon as he did something they didn't like, next thing you know, he, he becomes a pariah. And what does he do? He comes right back to the people that loved him from the beginning, straight up, period. So that's all it is. Um, I don't, I'm not even mad at this guy. I'm reading what he's saying, and I, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read this before. Yeah, I understand. Okay, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, good point. But, but really, at the end of the day, you need commerce, period. You know, you're going to lose the game if you can't build businesses. When you ain't got no entrepreneurs in your community, I don't give a shit whether you're talking about segregated, desegregated, integrated. I don't give a fuck. If you can't produce entrepreneurs and investors in your community, your community will lose in the game of global poweronomics. Point blank. That's all there is to it. I'm going to go. Hit the thumbs up button, please. Please hit the thumbs up button before you go. Make sure you subscribe, uh, all this other stuff. Uh, we also cover financial news every day at theblackfinancialchannel.com. T-H-E, that's theblackfinancialchannel.com. Also, also, please join us at blackenough.com. That is our social media platform, our Facebook for black people we created uh, to deal with situations like Farrakhan getting banned. Also, please uh, look up the case of Albert Wilson. Uh, the hashtag is free Albert Wilson. Albert Wilson, uh, no prior criminal record. He was alone with the girl for five minutes. There's no DNA evidence. He was a college student. They gave him 12 years in prison uh, for a rape he did not commit. Uh, there's no evidence that he committed this rape. So I hope that you'll find this hashtag and please support this brother because he needs our help. He needs our backing. This is happening to black men all over the country, and you guys need to know about that. All right, so I'm out of here, guys. Please hit the thumbs up button. And, uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, don't forget, summer's coming. If you want your kids to learn financial literacy, we have invented financial workbooks for black children, black children only. They're very, very good. You're going to love them. So if you'd like to take a look, please visit financialworkbooks.com. That's financialworkbooks.com. All right, I'm out of here, guys. Have a good day. I'll see you soon. Be good. Peace.